If you're looking for a go-anywhere luxury off-roader, oddly enough, you don't have too many options. But one of them, and one of the most capable, is this Defender 110. I have finally, after years of asking, been able to get my hands on a Defender 110 with the teeny tiny third row. So in this video, we're gonna be talking about that third row and how the Defender stacks up against the longer Defender 130, and of course, something like the Jeep Grand Cherokee L. The new Defender has been a huge hit for Land Rover, and I think it's easy to see why. Not only does it look fantastic, it gives Land Rover shoppers what they'd been asking for for quite some time. A Defender with more room, more variation, and better on-road driving dynamics. That's because this generation Defender is not a body-on-frame SUV, it's a unibody SUV related to the rest of the Land Rover lineup in North America. And it now comes in three different sizes. We have the Defender 90, that's logically the most off-road oriented version with a shorter wheelbase and a shorter body than the one that we're looking at here. We then have the Defender 110, this is the middle child. You can get this as a two row or a three row SUV then we have the Defender 130. Hopefully I'm gonna be able to get my hands on that next year, but that is the model with a more usable third row. Again, small third row here, bigger third row in the 130. That's the key difference. But they all have this very family look up front, which I think looks really good. And it's definitely one of the big reasons to get the Defender is just the style of this. It certainly has some homage to the original Defender lineup, but also somewhat of a concept car look on the front and on the back. As you'd expect, we have full LED headlights up front, nice and big and round there, LED fog lights below. This is not a metal panel, this is actually just a plastic trim panel, but as you'd expect in an off-roader, we do have skid plates under the body. The body on frame versus unibody debate has been around for a really long time, just about as long as people have been debating independent suspensions versus solid axles for off-road vehicles. This is an aluminum intensive unibody with a fully independent suspension. And that does present a few benefits for the Defender. The first one is it's better on-road because the wheels and the tires are not doing something different from the part of the vehicle that you're riding in. They're completely bolted together. Then there's the fact that a unibody vehicle can be a lot more torsionally rigid than a body on frame vehicle because everything is combined together. When combined with the four corner independent air suspension that we have in this vehicle, you also get some advantages that you don't normally think about in this debate. For instance, you can actually improve the clearance between the differential and the ground in the Defender but you can't in something like a Jeep Wrangler. In a Jeep Wrangler, the only way to improve that clearance is to put bigger tires on the Wrangler. And that's because that solid front axle and solid rear axle are always in the same place. And the only way to lift it up is to make the wheels and tires bigger. With this, you can just push the wheels down, effectively lift that differential out of the way, and you've created greater clearance along the center line of the vehicle. You haven't necessarily improved it around the suspension components, but you've definitely improved it around the engine, the transfer case, and the differentials. If you have the adaptive air suspension on your Defender, you'll get between eight and a half and 11 and a half inches of ground clearance, depending on the mode the suspension is in. If you opt for the regular steel spring suspension, which is available on some models, then you'll get about nine inches of ground clearance total. And of course, the suspension's not gonna move up and down. As I said before, the Defender comes in three different lengths, and this is the middle child, but it's actually a little smaller than you might be thinking. The square profile of this vehicle really belies its general size. This is only 187.4 inches long without the spare tire in the back. The spare tire adds about 10 inches of total length, but the body itself is about the same length as a four-door Jeep Wrangler or a four-door Ford Bronco. It's actually about seven inches shorter than a BMW X5. Land Rover's decision to put the spare tire on the back is actually kind of logical because it improves the departure angle of the vehicle, it allows them to have a really short overhang in the back, and it doesn't eat up space on the inside that could be occupied by passengers. If you want a bit more room inside, you want to look at the Defender 130 that shares the same 118.9 inch wheelbase as this model, but the body gets stretched by about a foot. Most of that room goes to the third row, a tiny bit goes to the cargo area as well. The entire vehicle ends up stretching all the way out to 211.7 inches long, which is definitely on the long side because of the spare tire still hanging out on the back. But the fit and finish and assembly quality on this Defender is particularly impressive. Not just because all the panels and gaps are perfect on this model, but because Land Rover did not make their job very easy. If you look at this line here that starts on the rear door, 
you'll notice it actually continues all the way along the side. The rear glass, the front door, the rear door, the A-pillar, the windshield, everything shares this common line all the way across the vehicle. And if these glass sections and the doors, the fixed sections and the movable sections were not in perfect alignment, it would look kind of funky. They also did the same just below this glass line with this line going all the way around the vehicle as well. Then they made a whole bunch of sharp corners and curves align right back here in the rear and thankfully they all come together really nicely. That kind of gives this the sort of concept car-like vibe that we also see in the current generation Range Rover with this incredibly vertical rear door and these really 3D lights in the back. The turn signals are red. I find that a bit of a bummer. Kind of wish we'd had some blinking amber turn signals. And for some reason, there are four lights in the back. They are a little bit hard to clean, I have to say. Everything else about this very flat-sided style is easy to clean, except for the taillights, and they're probably gonna get the most dusty of all. Then, of course, we get the big spare tire there in the back and a hitch receiver at the bottom because you can tow just over 8,200 pounds in the Defender 110 when properly equipped. A thoroughly modern Defender wouldn't be complete without all of Land Rover's latest active safety systems, so we find most of them standard on every model. That includes autonomous emergency braking, blind spot monitoring, rear cross traffic detection, lane keeping, their 360 degree parking aid, and a wade sensor that lets you know how deep you are in the water. The engine options and power levels are going to vary depending on which version of the Defender you get, 90, 110, or 130. The 110 is currently available with three different engines and four different power levels in the United States. Things are going to start out in the P300 with a 2-liter four-cylinder turbo that produces 296 horsepower, 347 pound-feet of torque. This model is the P400, which is probably gonna be the most popular engine to get. I think it's the engine I would get in the Defender as well. This gives you 395 horsepower, 406 pound-feet of torque. If you want a V8, you can still get one. It's the same Jaguar Land Rover 5-liter V8 that we've seen around for a while, bumped up to 493 horsepower and 450 pound-feet of torque, or if you get the P525 model, that goes up to 518 horsepower, 461 pound-feet of torque. But it's worth noting that if you get that engine, towing actually drops down to the same as the base model, just over 7,700 pounds. The only way to get the 8,200 pound towing capacity in the 110 model is to get the inline six. But if you get the 130, then it seems that most trims go over 8,200 pounds as far as towing capability. Thanks to the boxy design, headroom is fantastic up front. I'm six feet tall. I have about four and a half inches of headroom left sitting in kind of a reclined position. But even if I put this seat up as high as it will go, it does go pretty high, giving me sort of the feel of maybe driving a bus or something like that. I still have about two inches of headroom left. And again, this one has the panoramic moonroof, so lots and lots of headroom. However, you should know that the steering column, if you are really trying to elevate the seat up, it actually does kind of get a little bit close to your knees. So I think the ideal driving position is a little bit lower. But if you're a tall person or you have tall people up front frequently, you definitely want to take a look at the Defender over something like a BMW X5. This is certainly going to feel more spacious up front. As far as the seat itself goes, this is pretty comfortable, but not quite as adjustable as some of the competition for a similar price. So if you're looking at something like a Jeep Grand Cherokee L, for this price, you'd be able to get massaging seats and some extra adjustability. We do have a four-way adjustable lumbar support and power tilt and recline, but we don't have a powered steering column. It is a manual adjustment unit. Bearing in mind that this Defender is not as big as an X7, a GLS, or a Grand Cherokee L, we do find a little bit less legroom in the rear. With this front seat comfortably adjusted for me at six feet tall, I have maybe about four and a half inches of legroom left. You would be a little bit hard pressed to fit a larger rear facing child seat behind a six foot tall driver, unless they wanted to sit in that more upright position, which would maximize the space. So if I scoot over here to the right side, you'll see what's going on. This seat's all the way back in its tracks. I had a six foot five person sitting up there. I have now maybe about two inches of legroom left. The bench in the middle is pretty wide. That's one feature that I really appreciate here. And it moves in a 60-40 fashion. You'll see that it tilts and then slides forward. So you can't leave a child seat latch anchored into place, but you could slide the second row, if I can actually do this, you can slide it forward like that to try and apportion space between the middle row and the back row more equitably, but you notice there's not enough room to try and get there into the back. We do though have a 40-20-40 folding second row, so you could hop right through there into the back, and this 20% section 
is fairly wide. The third row itself honestly is a bit of a squeeze and keep in mind this is the smaller third row. The Defender 130 will give you a bit more room, definitely a bit more foot room, and the seat bottom cushion is pretty close to the ground. You also get kind of an unusual seat back back here because of where this headrest goes. When the headrest is folded, if I pull the little lever back there, it actually goes into this sort of little pocket area of the seat back. And that makes the seat back, I don't know, kind of, um, I guess, sports seat-esque, but clearly designed for someone that is much shorter than I am. Headroom though, <laughs> is again, absolutely fantastic. I have even more headroom back here than I had in the second row. And then there is the leg room. So I will go ahead and slide this seat, I have to, I have to move over here, all the way back so you can see what's going on. I didn't have an enormous amount of leg room in the second row. And I mean, I really just could not sit back here leg room wise in the third row. I could move this seat maybe to a position where I could, let's see. Okay, my knees are not quite, not quite back there. Okay, my knees are now in a position where they are touching the seat back and I can squeeze right there behind this seat. But as you'd suspect, there is a bit of a problem. With the second row in that position and that front seat still moved all the way back, there is basically no legroom left at all. If you're not using the third row, the cargo area is very generously sized. I was able to get six 24 inch roller bags back here because the cargo area is so incredibly square. Even though the opening itself is a little bit smaller than you might think because we really get a lot of a cut in right here around those light modules. And of course we get the fact that this is a hinge door. So the hinge occupies a little bit of room over here on the right side of the vehicle. Now on the other hand, if you want to use the third row, we can pull out this mat right here. And then the third row is revealed. It's a manual reclining third row. So we pull that up and then we lift those headrests into position. The result is this very narrow cargo slot behind. Maybe you could put a pencil stroller back here, maybe some computer bags or something like that, but you really can't put any kind of wheeled luggage behind the third row. Again though, we do have all of that headroom. The reality of course is most people will have the third row folded most of the time and that's why we have the same texturing on this cargo area floor as on the second row seat back. You can see the width of that practical center section that folds independently. And then we have some extra storage cubbies on each side. Then over here on this side of the engine compartment, we do find a 110 volt power outlet. It's just rated at 180 watts though. That is a little on the low side. Now let's take a look at the inside. Up here we have the controls for the large panoramic powered moonroof and its powered shade. You can see the size of that moonroof right there. It is one large panel up front and then kind of a teeny tiny panel behind. The large front panel opens, then of course we get those safari windows back there. As you might have guessed, that large glass panel does not open completely. It really opens about halfway. The theme of this interior is definitely classic meets modern. We have touches in here like exposed screw heads on the doors and exposed metal as well. This is not a trim panel or a trim piece. This is actually the metal from the door panel showing through. But this is still a luxury vehicle, so we get soft touch materials on the upper section of the door, around the armrest there, we get open pour wood trim, and three position memory for the front passenger seat. At the bottom of the door, we have a lot of additional storage space, and you can see that this interior features kind of a two-tone color scheme where we find a lighter color right here in the middle of the dashboard. It's embossed with that Defender logo there, and then it ties in with the doors with that lighter colored trim there as well. Up here, we have a grab handle-like feature on the dashboard. Again, more stitched and soft touch materials there, as well as lower on the dashboard. We then find a reasonably sized bin style glove compartment. I was not able to fit an 11 inch tablet computer inside, however. Now, speaking of tablet computer, it kind of looks like we have one here in the dash, but you notice it is a little bit on the small side, and that's because they really wanted this dashboard to have a very consistent theme. The downside to this design is that it does make this 11 inch screen look a little bit smaller than it actually is, just the way that it's positioned right there on the dashboard. This is running essentially the latest PIVI software from Land Rover. That's what they call this generation software. So of course we have built-in navigation, we have smartphone integration, air quality management, four x four information, all that sort of thing going on there. Two big air vents right up top, center channel speaker, and then some additional storage space behind the screen, or I guess I should say on either side of the screen. There's a USB-C charge port there, and these areas do have a little rubber mat inside to help grip things like smartphones that might be rolling around. 
Moving back to the center of the dashboard, we have a joystick style shifter. There's an unlock button right there, engine start stop button, and then the controls for the climate control as well as the off-road systems. This sort of combined control I do find a little bit odd. So we press this button here and then this becomes the off-road mode operation. So you can also touch those on the screen if you'd rather do that, or you could just continue rotating the knob around. And they also function as the seat heating and ventilation controls. So you can see if I push that, we then toggle one way for seat ventilation and the other way for seat heating. We then have a physical volume knob right there, but no physical track forward backward in the center console. Moving down from there, we have USB inputs for the system, a 12 volt power port, lots of storage space right there two big cup holders, and then some more exposed screw heads on either side of this wood trim. Behind the cup holders, we find a wireless charging mat. It's partially covered by this soft touch armrest. And then under that, we have a reasonably sized storage area. Keep in mind, this does have a two-speed transfer case and a rear wheel drive transmission there. So that's all hanging out under the center console. On the driver's side, we have the same full LCD instrument cluster we find in a number of other Jaguar Land Rover models. It's pretty configurable. You can choose between a number of different layouts, a one dial layout, a two dial layout. We also have a media centric layout, and of course, a moving map layout like that one right there, but no layout is gonna give you satellite imagery like we do find in some Audi models. The two-tone color scheme continues with the steering wheel where these spokes are color matched with the dashboard panels and the door panels as well. On this side, we find the controls for that multifunction LCD instrument cluster along with volume up, down, and track forward, backward buttons. And then over here, we have the controls for the standard adaptive cruise control and the heated steering wheel button. Land Rover's three liter inline six is not quite as peppy as some of BMW's, but it's pretty darn close. This scooted zero to 60 in 6.3 seconds. That's definitely a solid score for a vehicle this size and this curb weight. It's worth noting that if you want the Defender 130, it's actually not that much heavier than the Defender 110. The extra stretch in the back only adds about 150 pounds of total weight, and you do get that more usable third row, so you might wanna look in that direction. As far as stopping distance goes, keep in mind it is still a relatively heavy SUV thanks to the two-speed transfer case and all of that off-road focus that we find in the suspension design, so stopping distances are gonna be a little bit longer than some of the competition. It took this model 130 feet to stop from 60 miles an hour. That has to do not just with the curb weight, but also the tires. And in reality, the tires are probably a bigger factor here. This model has Goodyear Wrangler all-terrain tires on it. The tire choice definitely affects the handling score as well. I'm gonna give handling a B because even though this Defender is more on-road focused than Defenders of the past, it's still a solidly off-road focused luxury SUV. It has a good accurate steering rack to it. It's pretty easy to tell exactly what's going on up front, but the grip levels are not gonna be quite as high as some of the more on-road focused competition. Thanks to the extra ground clearance that we get, you're gonna notice it's also gonna have a bit more body roll, a bit more tip and dive than something like a BMW X7. That's just to be expected when you can get over 11 inches of ground clearance in this vehicle, and the standard ride height's gonna be right around nine inches. Some of the luxury competition, they're gonna be down there towards seven inches or so, so this is definitely gonna go further off the beaten path than something like a BMW X5. You'll also get the two-speed transfer case in here, which is something that most of the rear-wheel drive competitors do not offer. You won't be able to get a two-speed transfer case, especially in something like a Volvo XC90, which I guess you could see as somewhat of a competitor to this if you're simply looking for a small third row. You will not find it, of course, in a BMW X5 either. As you'd expect out of an off-road oriented SUV, ride quality is definitely good on a rougher road like the gravel road that we're on here. The air suspension and the general suspension design soak up large and small imperfections very well. And of course, the Wrangler tires are definitely designed for this kind of environment as well. The Wrangler all-terrains on this model are not the most aggressive off-road tire, but they're gonna give you a little bit more cushion than a more on-road focused tire would, and of course, better traction in adverse weather and mud and snow and things like that as well. Bearing in mind that most most of the competition for the Defender are more on-road focused SUVs like a BMW X5 or a Mercedes-Benz GLE or GLS, etc. I'm going to give ride quality an A+. Despite the tire choice, back out on the paved road we measured 70 decibels at 50 miles an hour, making this only a hair louder than the BMW X5, but right in line with the Audi Q7, the Volvo XC90, etc. Fuel economy is the one area where I think Land Rover needs to sharpen their pencil. 
Over a week of mixed driving, we've been averaging 17.1 miles per gallon in this model. That's probably because it's big and it's boxy. Even though the city fuel economy numbers are decent, out on the open highway, especially if you're going 70 or 75 miles an hour like you can in some areas, or even 80 miles an hour like you can in Texas, you're really going to notice that fuel economy start to drop because of the ground clearance and just the boxy profile of the Defender. If you're looking for something a bit more fuel efficient, well, you're not really going to find it with the kind of off-road capability we find in this outside of Land Rover's plug-in hybrid models. Now, those are going to give you plug-in hybrid capability, but they're not really going to improve your highway fuel economy when it's not operating as an EV. This is one of those areas where you really just have to pay to play. If you want features like a two-speed transfer case, like the off-road capability, all-terrain tires, etc., you're just going to have to accept lower fuel economy. Yes, you will find better fuel economy in the luxury segment, but you're not going to find better fuel economy in this kind of vehicle. You won't get the off-road capability. You won't get the room inside, etc. A Volvo XC90 T8, yeah, I, you know, I guess you could consider that a comparison. It's definitely a similar price tag to this, but it's not going to have as much room in the back. It's not going to tow or haul or off-road like this at all, but it will give you 27 miles per gallon. Ditto goes to the all-wheel drive plug-in hybrid version of the BMW X5. It's not going to be as capable as this, but the fuel economy is definitely solid. So how much will the Defender cost and how does it stack up against the competition? Let's dive into that now. Obviously, the Defender 110 is the middle child in the Defender lineup. But as long as you can handle the smaller third row, it is going to be a little bit less expensive than a Defender 130, depending on the exact configuration. It starts at $62,075 versus the Defender 90, which is the solid two-row model at $57,875, and the Defender 130, which starts just over $70,000. There's also a pretty decent price spread in the Defender lineup, with the Defender 110 going all the way up to $100. $128,185. If we take a look at this pricing chart here, you'll see the P300 model, which is the base engine that starts at the $62,000 price point. If you want the P400, which I suspect you probably do, that's going to be nearly $70,000 starting. And the V8 model minimum is going to be $94,775. So it is fairly expensive to get that much more powerful V8 engine. On the other hand, when you look at the price tags on the competition, you'll see that the Land Rover actually ends up being a decent deal, especially when compared against something like the Mercedes-Benz GLS, which does get fantastically expensive, up to $176,000, and this price range excludes the Maybach version, which gets even more expensive. Of course, in the Land Rover lineup, you could get more expensive. That would be where the Range Rover steps in, and the Range Rover is logically the corollary to those upper-end trims of GLS. But even compared against something like a Q7 or an X7, the Alpina X7 definitely gets pretty spendy. So let's just dive into the X7 here first. I have always liked the X7, I have to say. As far as luxury content, luxury features, interior comfort level, etc., I think the X7 is better than the Land Rover. Most likely it's going to be a little bit more reliable, although it's a little bit difficult to tell with brand new products. Style-wise, I love the way the Defender looks. I do think it looks better than the X7, but from a ride quality and luxury perspective, I would go with the BMW. Now, obviously, if you want off-road capability and you really are interested in taking your big SUV further off the beaten path, no contest, the win goes to the Land Rover. Also, on the styling front, I will say that style is very much a personal preference. And while I might prefer the more luxurious interior style in the X7, I honestly have to respect the rugged style that we find in the Land Rover. I think they did an excellent job of making it look retro meets modern, but not being cartoonish in a way that sometimes some retro vehicles can. The Land Rover definitely wins when it comes to value. You do find excellent performance in the base X7, slightly better performance than in the base Defender 110, but the Defender 110 is really well priced all the way up the line. And you'll notice that feature for feature, it's going to be less expensive than the BMW. Next up, we have the Audi Q7 and the SQ7. The Q7 has developed a reputation of being sort of the German minivan. It's big, it's roomy on the inside, although it's not as big in comparison to the competition as you might think anymore because there are now bigger competitive options. Back when the Q7 first came on the scene, we had a three-row X5, and that was it in the BMW lineup, and we had a three-row GLE, and that was it in that lineup. So the X7 felt really spacious inside. It was definitely a little bit roomier than something like the Volvo, 
pretty competitive with the Acura MDX, etc. But now we have much bigger luxury options, and we even have a Range Rover with three rows if you want something really luxurious, also that Maybach option. So in that relative set, the Q7 doesn't feel as spacious or as big as it once did, and realistically it's about the same size on the inside as the Defender 110. The next option from Europe is a long-term favorite here at Auto Buyer's Guide, and that's the Volvo XC90. It is less expensive, but keep in mind it's going to start with a relatively less powerful four-cylinder engine, and it is a front-wheel drive-based drivetrain, although you can also get a 455-horsepower plug-in hybrid system, and that is really the key to the success of the XC90. In the U.S., it does appear that the majority of XC90s sold now are actually the plug-in hybrid model, and I think for good reason. It's a really good blend of three-row practicality, a really well-done interior, very nice style on the outside, more of a restrained and elegant style to it. But also, Volvo has tried to keep this fresh. They've replaced the infotainment system over the years. They've also given this plug-in hybrid drivetrain several different engines and motors and battery combinations, which is how we end up now at this 455 horsepower drivetrain. If you want 27 miles per gallon, about 40 miles of EV driving range, and really fantastic real-world fuel economy, then you want the XC90. On the other hand, even with the adaptive air suspension, it's not going to be as off-road capable as something like the Land Rover. What is sort of the same thing is the last option we should talk about, and sometimes the most controversial. That's, of course, the Jeep Grand Cherokee L. Because the Grand Cherokee and the Defender, they are really the same kind of thing. You can get a two-row model, you can get a three-row model, you can get a short one, a long one, etc. But the Grand Cherokee is logically going to be less expensive. Starting around $44,500 and going up to around $88,000, the Grand Cherokee L is pretty expensive for a Jeep. Unless, of course, you factor in the Wagoneers, which go up into the six figures. The Grand Cherokee is a pretty decent match for the Defender when it comes to off-road capability, the off-road options. You can get adaptive air suspensions in these vehicles, locking differentials. You can also get a two-speed transfer case, etc. Features that we don't find in the typical luxury entry, which is why the Grand Cherokee has to be on this list. If you're looking for a luxurious vehicle, the Grand Cherokee also fits the bill in the top-end trims. You can get a full leather dashboard, full leather doors, lots of wood trim, passenger side LCD screens, etc., a lot of luxury touches that you generally don't normally associate with the Jeep brand, but you can definitely stick on your Grand Cherokee. Now for 2024, Jeep has not put their new turbocharged engines into the Grand Cherokee. So engines are really where the Grand Cherokee falls apart in this comparison a little bit. You get the naturally aspirated engine. That's going to be the only engine offered in the short Grand Cherokee, it appears. In the three-row Grand Cherokee, you can get the V8 still, but only in the very top-end trims, and it's probably not long for this world. So if you really want a naturally aspirated engine in your next vehicle in this category, act fast for the Grand Cherokee because we all know that the inline six turbocharged hurricane engines are going to be replacing the V8 soon. We don't know exactly what's going to happen with that base naturally aspirated V6, but my bet is it's probably going to be replaced by a low output inline six at some point in the future. Bottom lining the Defender is pretty easy. It obviously sells on its high style, that retro vibe, and of course the off-road capability. But it's definitely practical thanks to its very boxy styling. So if you're shopping for any entry in this luxury segment and you're thinking to yourself, I just wish I had a bit more room in the back for dogs, for a dog kennel, for gear, for camping stuff, or for third row passengers, then you definitely want to put the Defender on your shopping list. Just keep in mind some of the limitations. It's not going to be quite as luxurious on the inside as something like the BMW or the Mercedes. It's not going to be quite as much fun out on the road to drive either. But I think it's a really good balance of those capabilities. And again, it will certainly get you further off the beaten path. Be sure and hit that subscribe button if you haven't already done so. Find us over at Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all the other social platforms, and let us know what you think of the Defender. And do you think you would get it over the Grand Cherokee? I have to admit, I like the idea of this more off-road capable vehicle, especially where I live out in the country and the need that I have for four-wheel drive. But I have to admit also, I would probably get the Jeep over the Defender because it is so much less expensive. Let me know what you think about that as well. I'll see all of you later.